The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, follow the money and find the truth. Author Michelle Malkin did just that. You won't believe what she uncovered behind our open borders. Then, an unexpected fishing companion. The Holy Spirit visitation in my boat. And a voice from the beyond. Turn the boat around now. The greatest comeback in Bassmaster Classic history. I started catching fish on every cast. Today on The 700 Club. Well, welcome to this edition of The 700 Club. Invasion is imminent from the ground and from the air. Turkey is ready to charge into Syria, putting our allies, the Kurds, in grave danger. What CBN News has learned that could tip the balance of power in this volatile region. Plus, what is the threat to the U.S.? And ladies and gentlemen, I want to say right now, I am absolutely appalled that the United States is going to betray those democratic forces in northern Syria, that we possibly are going to allow the Turkish to come in against the Kurds. That Oda Erdogan is a thug. He has taken control of his country as a dictator. He is a strong leader, and a, to say he's an ally of America is nonsense. He is in for himself. And the president who allowed Khashoggi to be cut in pieces uh, without any repercussions whatsoever is now allowing the Christians and the Kurds to be massacred by the Turks. And I believe, and I want to say this with great uh, solemnity, the president of the United States is in danger of losing the mandate of heaven if he permits this to happen. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. This video shows U.S. armored vehicles leaving the area along Turkey's border. The pullout comes just hours after the White House announced U.S. troops would clear the way for an expected invasion by Turkish forces. Turkey's President Erdogan said the assault into northeast Syria was imminent. The decision has been made and the process has begun for the springs of peace and now opening up their path is as near as maybe today, maybe tomorrow. The decision by Trump allows Turkish forces to enter into the area controlled by the self-administration of northeast Syria or SANS. This government was formed after the Syrian civil war and has become a democratic entity with broad representation of all its peoples along with religious freedom. CBN's George Thomas is currently in Istanbul and added this report. Erdogan claims that the Kurdish rebel group that's operating in the northeast part of Syria, known as the YPG, is a threat to his country. And in fact, in the last couple of months, he's been threatening to eliminate the group. The United States, to try and appease Istanbul, told the Turks that they would hold joint military exercises in the region. But that didn't seem to calm the tensions. So today, we're on the verge of a potential Turkish invasion of northeast Syria. The White House decision is seen by some as a betrayal of the Syrian Democratic Forces, who have been the number one ally of the U.S. in the fight against ISIS since 2015. This decision threatens the new government and up to 100,000 Christians living mostly along the Turkish border. Erdogan also told the UN recently he wants to flood the area with up to 2 million Syrian refugees. Now CBN News has learned it's quite possible the democratic government there may surrender to Syrian President Assad before Erdogan moves. Although allied with Iran and Russia, they see Assad as a lesser evil than Erdogan. The surrender, however, may upset the fragile balance of power in a critical area of the Middle East. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. Jerusalem. Well, this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen, when the president of the United States is spending his time worrying about attacks from the other party and talk of impeachment. But nevertheless, when you look at Khashoggi, who was cut apart with saws brought in by uh, Sultan, the head of Saudi Arabia, and that happened to the Saudis with, with impunity. They got away with killing that, uh, that, well, that independent journalist. And now 100,000 Christians or more may be slaughtered. 
by the Turks. If you go back in history, all you have to see is what the Turks did to Armenia. And years ago, we heard about the starving Armenians. The Turks butchered thousands and thousands and thousands of Armenians. They don't hesitate to do that. Yes, they have been our strong allies, but under Erdogan, Erdogan is a thug. He has destroyed the democratic forces in his own country. He wiped out the, the leadership of the uh, armed forces. He has taken a, a, the, away the independence of the judiciary. And now our government is saying you have a free hand to go into Syria and take out the democratic forces and move against the Kurds. There are 36 million Kurds who need their own country. And they will uh, be a bulwark against the encroachment of the Iranians and the Turks and the Soviets and the other people who want to come in and destabilize that area. This would be one of the most shocking miscues in diplomatic history. Well, in other news, Democrats are making a big deal over a second whistleblower. And he's talking about the same phone call the president has already made public. Wendy Griffith has more on that. Thanks, Pat. An attorney says this latest whistleblower is also a member of the intelligence community and has direct knowledge of the president's phone call with Ukraine's president. But the White House and some of its defenders say since the president made the call public, there's nothing new to talk about. Why should I care at all what his perspective or his opinion and judgment of this transcript is? You and I can read it. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham says the accusation about Trump's Ukrainian phone call is a political setup and that the president did nothing wrong. Well, as Congress turns up its impeachment probe against President Trump, Energy Secretary Rick Perry is now a target over his deep ties to Ukraine. In an exclusive interview, Pat uh, Perry sat down with CBN News senior Washington correspondent Jennifer Wishon to talk about his efforts to fight corruption and what he knew about the president's interest in Joe Biden. What is your business in Ukraine? I probably have had as um, uh, expansive a re relationship with Ukraine as anybody in the administration, certainly at the cabinet level. As chief of the nation's energy agency, Rick Perry focuses a lot of time on Ukraine. Our interest was always and still is uh, trying to help Ukraine become as independent as it can be from an energy standpoint. Uh, they've been held hostage by Russians, by Russian gas. Now comes word from President Trump that the infamous phone call with the Ukrainian president came at Perry's urging. In a statement to CBN News, Perry's spokeswoman says, Secretary Perry absolutely supported and encouraged the president to speak to the new president of Ukraine to discuss matters related to their energy security and economic development. Perry tells CBN News he's personally discussed Ukrainian corruption with President Trump, Rudy Giuliani, and several ambassadors. It's not once, as God is my witness, not once was a Biden name, not the former vice president, not his son ever mentioned. You know, corruption was talked about uh, in the country, but it was always uh, a, a relatively uh, vague term of, you know, the oligarchs and, and this and that and what have you. Um, but I'm quite comfortable. I mean, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm extremely comfortable that not did the president of the United States or any of his, his administration or his team uh, ever talk about uh, and with the intent of there was some quid pro quo. Instead, he says the administration is intensely focused on getting Ukraine to clean up its own business culture. And the message was clear. You clean up the corruption and the United States will be, uh, you know, certainly willing to come in and help you. We, I can't go in good faith and tell a, a U.S. company, you know, go and invest here, go and, and be involved if the corruption is still ongoing. Despite all the scrutiny, Secretary Perry traveled to Lithuania Sunday to meet with Ukrainian and other regional leaders to discuss energy security. I think this is a, uh, you know, obviously the continued attempt to take this president any way they can because they don't like the way the election turned out in 2016. Regardless, Perry will likely remain under a microscope for the foreseeable future. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Thanks, Jennifer. Pat, what do you think? Well, I, I think the secretary is exactly right. The Russians have held uh, Eastern Europe hostage to their gas. 
uh, Gazprom is the big company in Russia, and what they wanted was a, uh, Angela Merkel uh, assisted in that, by the way, of having a pipeline from Russia in for natural gas into uh, Germany and into Eastern Europe. And uh, that was gave the Russians the power to turn the tap off and put the people in, in freezing cold. So uh, uh, what Secretary Perry has said is exactly right. They were looking for energy independence. And you look at uh, Chairman Schiff and these other people, and it's just uh, uh, nonsense to say it was all based on political calculation. It was based on the best interest of the United States. And by the way, you hear all this talk about uh, subpoenas being issued to the president and so forth. The Constitution is very, very clear. The House can engage or initiate uh, hearings for the removal of a president for impeachment. The House. It takes the entire House. It cannot be the uh, speaker. It cannot be one party. It has to be the whole House. That's what the, that's what the Constitution says. And so the president has an absolute right to say, until you have a vote of the House, your subpoenas to us are not legal. Wendy? Pat, the U.S. Supreme Court begins its new term today on the docket. Several cases that could affect religious freedom and possibly lead to the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Paul Strand reports on these potential landmark decisions. The court starts off the new term with cases that could hit religious believers hard. One involves a funeral home and a fired transgender worker. And it could have broader implications for existing civil rights law and invasion of privacy. It involves a man named Anthony Stevens who worked at a Christian funeral home and announced to his bosses that he wanted to become Amy Stevens and start wearing dresses instead of business suits to work. He was terminated and he sued. The owner is saying, I believe it's, a, it's a, almost a ministry, really, in my business, reaching out to and supporting families who are grieving. Um, and it would be a distraction from that to have uh, someone who is a biological male wearing a dress. Tom Ross heads up Harris Funeral Homes. The families that we serve, how would they possibly react to this? People may think that this case is simply about whether a business can fire someone for being transgender. John Bursch represents the funeral homes. He says their defeat could have huge and harmful implications. It can mean the violation of intimate privacy spaces at high schools and colleges, including showers, restrooms, and locker rooms. And it also affects the privacy spaces at uh, shelters, women's shelters, where recently in Alaska, a man who said he was a woman demanded to sleep three feet away from women who had been raped and sexually abused. As for abortion, the court has agreed to take up a Louisiana case that might have a big impact. It would force abortion doctors to have admitting privileges at local hospitals. Pro-choice types say that's too restrictive. Pro-life advocates like Alan Parker of the Justice Foundation say it could strike at the heart of legalized abortion. The court could use that to overturn Roe v. Wade. Pro-life advocates showed up at the court last week armed with a petition signed by a quarter of a million people. It asked the court to overturn Roe v. Wade, the 1973 ruling that legalized abortion. And many believe now is the best opportunity in years to tackle Roe. There is new evidence, new scientific evidence, new facts that this court needs to consider, and that would justify overturning the president of Roe versus Wade. There's about 10 or 15 cases that could be the one that overturns Roe v. Wade that are moving towards the Supreme Court. The reason the people who are big advocates for religious liberty hope that the court will take up more of their kind of cases is because, especially with two Trump appointees, they feel that the justices are leaning more favorably towards people of faith. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Supreme Court. Thank you, Paul. Pat, so many important cases, and what a time to pray. It's remarkable what's happened in our society, but this Roe versus Wade, it was a put-up case by the ACLU. They found a phony uh, plaintiff and then brought a phony case based on phony uh, support, and it had no basis whatsoever in law that we've ever had before. And the case was called Blackman's Abortion because he was the one who uh, was the deciding judge in that case. But uh, it, it said a woman, uh, there's a constitutional right uh, to have an abortion, a constitutional. 
once you you elevate a, a police matter of a state into the federal uh, arena, then of course the plaintiffs have nowhere to go. It's all over, and it's taken away from the power of the citizens to vote on what they want to do. And so uh, it, it was a terrible decision. We've had nothing but controversy ever since because the courts stepped in and did something they shouldn't have done. And it was based on the so-called right of privacy, and it goes back to that Griswold versus Connecticut and all that business about emanations and penumbras and all that nonsense that some judge came up with. And it, it, that was the basis of Roe versus Wade. And it should have been uh, overturned then. And Norman McCauby, who was the uh, plaintiff in the matter, has actually, uh, I think, repudiated her stand in uh, Roe versus Wade. It should be reversed. It's long overdue. Terry? Well, coming up later, a big fishing competition, and you'll never believe who got in the boat with the fishermen. How the winner made the biggest comeback in Bass Master Classic history. But first, she followed the money, and guess what she found? Author Michelle Malkin blows the immigration crisis right out of the water. That's next. Follow the money. That's what author Michelle Malkin has to get the truth behind the assault on our southern border. And what did she find? Powerful forces at work trying to undermine our course of country. Take a look. If you want to know what's behind the caravans of illegal migrants surging toward the U.S. border day in and day out, follow the money and find the truth. That's what conservative commentator and author Michelle Malkin says in her new book, Open Borders, Inc., Who's Funding America's Destruction. Malkin follows the money trail, tracing tens of billions of dollars spent or received by more than 400 nonprofits, charities, lobbying groups, and businesses raking in tens of millions of dollars while promoting mass, uncontrolled immigration. Open Borders, Inc. reveals the powerful forces Malkin says are working to destroy America as we know it. Well, author and commentator Michelle Malkin joins us now from Denver. And Michelle, welcome to the 700 Club. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. I'm so glad to be back. Listen, uh, this book, you've done an exhaustive study of the whole matter. What is, let, let, let's talk about what is the game what do these people want to accomplish by these open borders? Well, when I say follow the money, find the truth, um, that is my investigative mantra. And unfortunately for many of these groups, not only domestically within the United States, but around the world, uh, when they talk about welcoming the stranger, what it's really about is financial profit. That is what's driving this, the money motive. Uh, and many people around the world are involved in what I consider a human smuggling racket globally. Uh, so when you have groups like Pueblo Sin Fronteras, for example, which uh, came to the public's attention when these illegal alien caravans started uh, really laying siege to our southern border and escalating their activity when President Trump took office, you have to look at the provenance of groups like that, and, uh, and it does trace back to one of the most notorious figures of Open Borders Incorporated, George Soros. Um, he has created an entire network and an infrastructure of nonprofit left-wing groups that operate in a highly partisan manner uh, to sabotage our border and to obstruct immigration enforcement. There's also an electoral imperative. For the Democrat Party, this really is about securing a permanent ruling majority. Uh, and for many of the multinational corporations, it's about importing as many low-wage foreign workers into our country as possible. Let's talk about Soros. He's a Hungarian. I understand that he isn't even accepted in his own country. What is his game? He's a super rich man. Why does he do this? 
Well, Pat, uh, he has earmarked $18 billion out of his $25.2 billion net worth, which he achieved as a hedge fund manager. And we don't have to guess about what his agenda is. I read uh, very carefully a book of his called The Case for Global Governance, and he makes clear what he wants. Sovereignty, he said, not only of the United States, but pretty much every Western ind industrialized nation is, quote, an obstacle to global governance. And what, it's, what is, this is really about is a few choice oligarchs wanting to use the United Nations and other transnational organizations as their vehicles to claim power over the right of, of every sovereign nation to uh, exercise its self-determination. Um, in large part, it means sabotaging our southern border, and you see that, but it's not just about illegal immigration. It's about controlling who we determine gets into our country, what numbers they are, what traits they bring. And through the Refugee Resettlement Program, which is the pet project of the United Nations and George Soros, what they're doing is redistributing the world into our country. All right. Uh, Michelle, uh, you pointed out uh, in Mexico, they have standards totally contrary to what these globalists are talking about. Yes, so I talk about uh, an entire shelter network <laughs> that's been propped up uh, by many of these non-governmental organizations, many of them with what seem to be very benign intent. For example, Doctors Without Border or Save the Children. And unfortunately, there are a lot of social justice hijacked religious organizations, and I pinpoint the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops as among the largest profiteers in all of this, and I am a Catholic myself, uh, and uh, you know, it was rather painful to document how billions of dollars are are being made by the Vatican uh, in order to um, ship uh, millions of people across the southern border and, and fill their pews and their collection plates. But I think it's very important when you listen to Pope Francis, who has an anointed himself one of the leaders of the anti-Trump resistance, uh, when they talk uh, about their mission to, uh, you know, fulfill their for faith and talk about compassion, for them, really, what, what, what's at stake is billions of dollars of tax subsidies as well. Because the refugee resettlement racket, for example, has uh, poured billions of dollars into the coffers of the Catholic bishops and many of their sub-organizations, many of them which trace their roots uh, to partnerships with some of the most radical figures on the left, for example, Saul Alinsky. All right. Let's talk about uh, uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center. You, you have a whole section about them. Talk about them. Yes, the Southern Poverty Law Center is a Soros-funded organization, which I consider to be the most ruthless and efficient smear machine against conservatives, Christians, immigration enforcement patriots, and pro-lifers that has operated for nearly 30 years. Even some liberal journalists have talked about the fraud that's perpetrated by this group, which redefines um, their political opponents' free speech as quote-unquote hate. So they put out this hate map. They put pretty much every effective Christian organization on that list. Uh, I've been in their uh, targets and sites for the last 20 years. Uh, and what they do is, is try and deplatform the most uh, outspoken and effective uh, spokespeople for American sovereignty, uh, for the role of religious liberty in our lives. And they have teamed up with another Soros-funded organization, the Council on American Islamic Relations, uh, to do everything possible to uh, essentially criminalize the free speech and peaceable assembly rights of people on the right. Uh, is anybody um, joining you in, in, in this? Well, you see, the ultimate game, as I understand from Soros, is to eliminate borders so they can be one world government and to take away the sovereignty of America. Is, is, is that the ultimate game that they're trying to play? It is. Fortunately, we do have a commander in chief President Trump, who went to the United Nations and called these people out. He gave one of the most significant speeches, a muscular defense of American sovereignty two weeks ago, and it was drowned out by many of these same Soros-funded organizations which have posed a resistance movement uh, to conservatives for 20 years now. And this is why you see all of this impeachment palooza. It's to distract from the most important existential uh, policy question of our time. Are 
are we a sovereign nation or a sanctuary nation? And you see all of these uh, stories in the headlines about these elected officials and police chiefs uh, who are protecting illegal aliens, who are subverting the authority that immigration enforcement agents have. The Abolish ICE movement is also funded by Soros, and people are joining me. Uh, in fact, over the last three weeks that I have been on the book tour for Open Borders, Inc., thousands of people have turned out for Stand With ICE rallies that I'm holding. It is not just about standing with immigration enforcement, but for law enforcement in general, many of these same forces that oppose immigration enforcement have been the biggest cop bashers yeah. uh, in American politics for the last 30 years. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for being with us. The book, ladies and gentlemen, is called Open Borders, Inc. Who's Funding America's Destruction? Michelle Malkin is available where books are sold. And uh, you'd find it very interesting. It's extensive. The research is unbelievable. She does her homework. She really does. Terrific reporter. Wonderful. Well, Terry, what's next? Still ahead, a YouTube favorite. Your questions, honest answers. Sarah says, my husband said when we married, he was born again. Three years later, he tells me he's not. What do I do? Stay tuned for Pat's advice. That's coming up later. And then up next, an epic battle between man and fish. You won't believe who's riding shotgun. How one fisherman became a world champion with a whole lot of help from beyond. Randy Howell was in 11th place. The media had written off any chance that he might win the 2014 Bassmaster Classic Fishing Tournament. Then, suddenly, an unexpected visitor appeared in his boat riding shotgun, and Randy was about to make history. I used to think it was pretty cool all the time that, that Jesus was always with fishermen and, uh, and ever golfers and the Bible was always fishermen. That's kind of my joke about that. And, and uh, so uh, it did draw me to want to want to read more and learn more, just interested in why Jesus chose fishermen. Randy Howe has always loved fishing. The fishing lifestyle is a lifestyle of faith because you're chasing after, you know, a little green fish that, you're, that you don't see. You know, and it's a lot like your journey with Christ. It's all faith-based. You can't see it, you know, so that's a pretty good parallel. Randy came to faith as a young boy while attending vacation Bible school. About 12 years old is when I really felt the, the Holy Spirit tugging at my heart and that conviction to where I knew, you know, what right and wrong really was and that I wanted to, you know, be saved and have a relationship with, with Jesus. He says that from a young age, he knew he had a call that might involve fishing. My mom took me to a lot of revivals and a lot of places like that. Pastors would, would call me out in a crowd there and say, you know, God's got, uh, a, you know, a special calling on your life. But as a teen, Randy began experiencing health issues that threatened to derail his dreams of a fishing career. I found out I had ulcerative colitis, but little did I know it was going to turn into something big and major, you know, where surgeries were going to be required, and that, that was the big shocker. After high school, Randy married Robin and got his first pro fishing tour card when his illness struck with a vengeance. I was on the lake fishing, and the first day I was in 10th place, and I needed to make the top 10 to advance to the All-American. I started throwing up blood. I came in from fishing. Uh, I was by myself. I lived eight hours from where I was at the tournament, so I worked my way back, stopping at gas stations, throwing up blood. Randy got to a hospital in Rocky Mount, North Carolina, just in time. Doctors said, you know, you were within a couple hours of, of having peritonitis, and I, I could have died within hours if I hadn't have got there, and that was what made it really real when they, when they told me that. But I had a lot of infections, so they only took two-thirds of my colon out in my first surgery. Because of his health problems, Randy began to wonder if he would ever fish professionally. At Duke, the doctors, you know, said, this is going to be a very difficult thing to chase for you because you're going to end up having a lot of issues with going to the bathroom, possibly more surgeries in the future. And it was a very, it was kind of discouraging report. The illness caused Randy to pursue the Lord deeper. When adversity hits you for the first time, that's when you truly, you know, you go from really religion to relationship. And I totally submitted my life to him at the time, and I said, Lord, whatever you want me to do with my life, whether it's fishing or something else, here I am, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm ready to do it. I'm just thankful to be alive. That's where God's 
miracle working power came in and healed me quickly because those surgeries should have taken six to nine months between each one, but instead I had all three surgeries within four months, and that was the part that was miraculous. Now that he was healed, Randy went back to fishing. Not only was he winning tournaments and getting endorsements, he now had a platform to share his faith. That's when God said, you know, I didn't call you to be a missionary in China. I called you to be a fisherman, and this is what I want you to go do. So that's where my speaking kind of started. Jesus told stories, and that's what the parables were in the Bible, and that's all I had to do was tell my story, and that's all anybody has to do is tell their story to bring people to know Jesus, and that was, that's what fired me up and got me excited. God was preparing him for the biggest moment in his professional life. In 2014, he was fishing in the Bassmaster Classic at Guntersville Lake, Alabama. I was in 11th place after two days, and uh, all the media had pretty much, you know, written it off that I could, that anybody outside the top 10 could have a chance of winning. And that's the day that I went out the next morning. And I'm running up the lake, and and it had a clear, just the clearest ever of, of just a Holy Spirit visitation in my boat. And I saw a vision in my mind and and said, turn the boat around now and go to this bridge. And I saw a quick glimpse like a video in my head of me under this bridge casting and catching fish. Randy heeded the voice. I turned the boat around and ran back to this bridge and as soon as I pulled up I started catching fish on every cast and and made the at the time the, the greatest comeback in Bassmaster Classic history. I was almost 10 pounds behind. I came back with the largest catch of the day, 29 pounds, two ounces, and ended up winning by one pound, winning $300,000 the world championship. I didn't do it, it was God that did it that day. Randy is now one of the top rated bass fishermen in the world. He has had no health issues and continues to win major tournaments. And he continues to tell his story. You gotta fall in love with Jesus, you can't just get a Bible and just say, you know, and go to church and say I'm a Christian. And when you do that and you go all in, you see it happen and then, then you know it's real. The adversity is going to make you stronger and, and it's just going to make you persevere. When you know who's in control and you discover your purpose, then you can make a difference. You just got to go all in and believe and God will open the doors and take care of you. Well, I can't say it any better than Randy did. You got to go all in, trust God, and He's got a plan and a purpose for your yeah, life. What amazing. a story. Yeah. You know? But that's that's what, you know, you remember the Lord's on the boat? He said, cast your net on the other yes, side. Yes, exactly. 153 fish. Okay. He knows where they are. <laughs> he, he, he knows about the fish. Time all for right. some email, Pat. This first one comes from Sarah, who says, My husband said when we were married he was born again. Three years later, he tells me he never actually has been, but has tried. He believes in God, but doesn't care what God thinks. I feel cheated of something that is so important to me. I'm at a complete loss. What do I do? Well, I, I think the Bible says that uh, people are one to the Lord by the godly conduct of their wives. And I, I think you ought to pray that he will find the Lord. From a legal standpoint, there's, there's something called fraud in the inducement. Fraud in the inducement. And if you're, there's fraud going in, then the contract isn't valid. And uh, but you you don't want to get out. What you want to do is to get in deeper, and you want your husband. But by your godly conduct, he will find the Lord. And so you need to pray for him. Mm -hmm. All right. This is Billy who says, I am a Christian and I love the Lord so very much. I know the Lord forgives our sins. Why do I keep remembering the bad things I did? Well, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to have our consciences cleansed from dead works to serve the living God, and. What you're saying is God's a liar. You say, well, I'm not going to say that. Yes, you are. Because God says, your sins and your, and, and your transgressions I will cleanse, and they're under the blood of Christ. And what you, you need to do is to accept his forgiveness. So, you know, the question is, you know, God will forgive you, but will you forgive you? And you've got to forgive yourself. But you need to accept the word of God that says, you know, your conscience is to be cleansed of dead works to serve the living God. All right? Okay, this is a viewer who says, Dear Pat, I have this reoccurring sin in my heart. Sometimes I think wicked things. It scares me. I think of sentences like, Satan is Lord, and I've cursed God in my thought life. I'm so embarrassed to even share this. So what should I do? How should I go about dealing with this deep mistake? I'm very worried. Um, the Bible says nobody can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. 
And uh, I think nobody can curse the Lord uh, except by the power of the Holy Spirit, or at least the absence of him. I, I don't understand what's going on in your mind, but uh, I, if I were you, I would get some people. I think you're, you're not possessed, but you're being oppressed by a demonic spirit because only Satan would say, Jesus is accursed. Mm -hmm. And I think what you need to do is to get people together, and you need to have, have an intervention. And you need to say, in the name of Jesus, I command you, Satan, to loose me, and I uh, take authority over you and the forces of evil. Speak it out. I bind you, Satan, and the forces of evil, and loose me from this moment on. All right? This is Carla, who says, My husband and I are born-again Christians, and we do not consume alcohol. My husband's family is not. Should we attend their weddings and parties knowing there will be drinking, inappropriate speech, etc.? It's very uncomfortable to be around unbelievers. Well, let's face it. If you're not around them, you'd have to go out of the world, Paul said. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying I like club soda. You know, you could be an alcoholic and have to drink club soda. That you don't know. It's not up to you to explain to them. But I'd rather have a little club soda, please. You want some some brandy or some bourbon or some scotch? No, I just like some club soda. Mm -hmm. People go to bars and they eat. They drink club soda, no problem. If you like tea, you can eat, drink a cup of tea. You just you know, get out there because Jesus went out with the sinners. You know. He didn't call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So how are you going to reach them unless you get out there with them? So you feel uncomfortable. I think you need to understand these are the people for whom Christ died. All right. Mm -hmm. This is Laura who says, my husband and I want to have children and we're unable to naturally because my husband was born with a rare birth defect. Our only option to have biological children is to use in vitro fertilization. Does IVF align with God's will? Is it wrong? There could be multiple embryos possible and these would be donated to other infertile couples. Uh, I don't see anything in the world wrong with that. There's a technology that's been developed and I believe that uh, that could be used to bring forth a child. I don't understand exactly how the in vitro is going to work in your life. I guess they, they, whether you, you've got an egg and, and sperm and, and you create an embryo on a, in a t test tube and then implant it, I, I guess that's I what think that's, I think yeah. that's what happens. I don't see anything wrong with that. If, if you want to be a mother, a father, and have children, but you got to be careful. You know, that that uh, fer uh, fertility doctor, I think, in Northern Virginia who uh, used his sperm to impregnate 50 or 60 women, and so he had all these children. Yeah. You, you want to make sure who the donor is <laughs> before you, you accept it. Make sure that you, you're not having some child that's got yeah. some kind of uh, uh, congenital disease. But there's nothing wrong with it, I can see. All right. Well, thanks for your answers, thank you. and thank you thank all you for your much. questions. We love hearing from you. Still ahead, combat on the battlefield and a war zone at home. Worse yet, the family of five is still not back in their own house. So what went wrong? That's coming up. Welcome back to the 700 Club. A school district in Wisconsin changes its graduation speech policy after a complaint by the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Pastor and school board member Alvin Dupree referenced his faith during a graduation ceremony in June. Now, speeches will have to be submitted two weeks in advance for approval. Dupree responded to the changes saying, quote, I support freedom of speech for all, no matter what. I will stand on the godly principles that God's word represents. Well, a special CBN program turns 20 years old. CBN is celebrating its Indonesian flagship program, Seleucy, this year. Thousands of episodes have aired since its launch back in 1999. This year, Seleucy's episodes began targeting millennials with a new program format. As a result, Seleucy earned the number one spot on 12 national TV stations three times in July. 
In addition, Salusi's YouTube channel has now reached more than 100,000 subscribers. And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. One year after a Category 5 hurricane flooded their home, Micah and Courtney still can't live in it. Even worse, insurance won't pay another cent. Where was this military family going to get the money to rebuild? They didn't have a clue. Special Ops medic Micah has seen his share of combat on the battlefield in Afghanistan. His wife, Courtney, is extremely proud of her husband's decorated military career. It definitely takes a special person to be willing to go, you know, knowing I might not come home. Yeah, I'm definitely very proud of what he did. In October 2018, the family faced a war zone at their own home when Category 5 Hurricane Michael pummeled Panama City, Florida. Floodwaters rose to the ceiling of their house, destroying everything except the home's framework. You think it's going to be a couple months and they'll um, get you back in your house, but, you know, as you can see, down to the studs, so did not expect this. In fact, it's been nearly a year since the family of five evacuated. They've been living in this 30-foot camper ever since. There's been some real trying times where God has really had to work on us and teach us some hard life lessons and uh, teach us to lean on Him when we're pretty much out of strength. Then another blow to an already difficult situation. Their insurance company told them their policy had reached its limit and the family would be responsible for the remaining repairs that would cost thousands of dollars, money they didn't have. Hey, their pastor, Andy Lambert, asked them over to get an update on the situation. Insurance company is now looking at our claim saying, you guys are completely maxed out. You know, there is no more money to give you guys to replace that brick. There is no more money to give you guys to replace the electrical. I have no idea where it's coming from. I do know that we serve a big God and a good God, and I know, you know, I know that He will, he'll, He will supply it. You know, He will. The couple didn't know that Pastor Andy with First Baptist Church Panama City had already contacted CBN's Helping the Home Front. This organization, Helping the Home Front, is gonna step in and they're gonna pay for the electrical work that you haven't been able to do. Awesome. Wow, thank you. thank you. They're gonna take it one step further and they're gonna take care of that brickwork so it can be done right. I mean, you brought up a pretty big number. Thank you. <laughs> Very grateful. Um, we had no idea where it was gonna come from, but Very thankful. Yeah, Helping the Home Front has been just an organization that really it does represent uh, the body of Christ caring for military and veterans who, who are in dire circumstances. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. A few weeks later, contractors started on the work the couple initially couldn't afford. CBM providing this is definitely something I did not expect at all, so. I'm very thankful that there are people who are willing to come alongside CBN and be partners with them to give other military members and veterans gifts like this. This is such a great, um, such a great gift. Isn't that something? They served the country. They were out in the combat zone and they come home and the government isn't there for them. There's only so much, and the insurance they have is only so much, and they're destitute. Well, we don't think that's the way we ought to treat our service people, and so CBN, with your help, has gotten something called Helping the Home Front, where we stand alongside some of these brave men and women who've been in our armed forces and who need a hand, and uh, that was one example of what we do so when you join the 700 Club with $20 a month, $240 a year, you become part of an army of hundreds of thousands of people who make available money enough 
that we can reach out to people like uh, Randy and his uh, wife and help them uh, when there's an urgent need. So helping the home front is one, just one of the things that CBN does. And listen, for those of you who want to join, and I do hope you say yes, I want to give you something called the Transforming Word, Proverbs Verses of Wisdom, Favor, and Anointing. And I think this will be a blessing to each one of you. I hope so. But you can call in right now and say, you can count on me. It's just 65 cents a day. We're not talking about huge amounts of money. But if a lot of people get together, it makes up a, enough to help people. And we want to help people. So go to your telephones and call in. It's 1-800-700-7000. 1-800-700-7000. And so you can count on me and we'll send you uh, this DVD called The Transforming Word, which we hope will bless you. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, when Penny Cole felt a migraine coming on, she completely shut down. The pain was so severe that even her hair hurt. Doctors tried for 30 years, but they couldn't help Penny. So how could her pain vanish one day in an instant? I was hit on the driver's side by a pickup truck, broke my hip, broke my pelvis in seven places, injured my back, injured my neck. I had to go through a physical therapy to learn how to walk again. When Penny Cole was young, she suffered injuries from two car accidents that left her with excruciating migraines. The migraines came on um, severely after the second accident. It was a headache that would come up over the skull and just um, kind of engulf the entire head area. They were to the point to where my hair hurt. Penny lived with the pain for 30 years. I would just basically have to lay in bed all day um, in a darkened room um, with quiet because sound would irritate it, um, light would irritate it. I couldn't move, I got sick, um, I couldn't eat. It basically just stopped everything that I was doing. Doctors said there was nothing they could do other than prescribe painkillers. They would put me out, but they wouldn't touch the headache. Any kind of relief that I could get from it, I would try, um, but nothing would relieve them. In July of 2018, she was watching the 700 Club when Terry Mewson had a word of knowledge for someone suffering with migraines. I was praying with my head down and I immediately looked up and I was looking at the, at the TV because she was describing my headache better than I could describe my headache to the doctors. And so I immediately knew that she was talking about my headaches. Yeah, there's someone else you have, you think you have um, a history of migraines. Actually, you have a deformity where your, um, where your spinal cord connects with your brain stem. But God is healing that for you right now. You'll know this as you because those headaches, when you have them come like right from the back of your head over the top of your head. You've had them for years, but today they are gone in Jesus' name. Just receive that healing. I could feel a tingling coming from the back of the, from the um, base of my spine. And it just, the tingling went up over my head just like my headaches did. And so um, when all the tingling was done, the headache that I had had for almost three weeks at that point in time was gone. When I called the prayer line, um, that's when I was explaining to him what had happened and I had actually started crying. Penny has not had a migraine since then. I know there's a lot of people that are skeptical of God healing. That's because they don't have that relationship with God and they don't know that He can actually do that. You know, when you're talking to God and you're asking God to heal you, you got to expect for Him to do that. But once it happens to you, there is no denying that it's God that does it. Healing is a very awesome, wonderful thing to experience and to watch other people experience. 30 years of incredible pain, and in one moment, God set this woman free. I don't know her, but I surely am happy for her. We want to pray for you right now. We have a little bit of time left on the program, and I know many of you wait for this moment. I don't know what you're crying out to God for, but whatever it is, we want to gather with you. Pat and I are going to join hands, and we're going to pray together with you for whatever is going Amen. on in your life. With God, all things are possible. Thank you. Father, in Jesus' name, we hold before you the people in this audience. They're crying out to you, and they're saying, God Almighty, I'm suffering, I'm hurting, touch me. 
And we pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody has got something in the jaw. There's, there's like a, a growth in your jaw in some fashion, and it's very painful. Touch your jaw right now in the name of Jesus. Be made whole. And Terry? I don't know if this is the same person or not, but you've had dental work, and somehow there's been an abnormal growth around that dental work, and it's all, oh, it's a mess. See. God is clearing that up for you right now. Just receive it. Thank you, Lord. There are several people suffering from financial hardship right now. There's a mortgage. Somebody's concerned about a mortgage. It's $130,000. And God's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. He's going to make a way right now. Thank you, Lord. And you will find that you will find the resources necessary to take care of the mortgage and to live your life. Terry, you have anything? Yeah, someone else, you have these moments of, um, I don't even, like, like, murkiness in your thinking, like you can actually not exactly remember where you are, what you're doing. It's very frightening to you. It's not consistent, but God is healing all of that in your brain right now. You're not going to experience it anymore. Clarity and sharpness will be yours. Amen. Amen. Just receive something from the Lord. Raise your hands and thank Him. Thank Him for God's power. Well, today's Power Minute is from 2 Corinthians. For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.